get started. So I want to turn it over to Julie for our presentation on uh, peeling back the layers of auto DevOps. This is uh, really exciting. Awesome. Um, I am going to share my screen. And as I do that, a couple housekeeping items. John, you've been great at organizing this and getting us working in the GitLab way. So there is a document in the agenda that you can take notes in and also put in questions as we go. And let's jump into it. I'm gonna re try really, really hard to obey our time box today. So that's my goal, 50 minutes and we're out of here and give time for discussion throughout as well. So let's see if that happens or not. All right, so as I um, start to tackle things like this and presentations or projects that I'm working on, I like to write them in terms of a user story, you know, what the heck am I trying to accomplish? What's the value in even putting all this effort into this particular topic? So for this particular topic, you know, I have to be honest, I started digging into auto DevOps because I was just frustrated as all heck that I was getting review app failures constantly. Like my customers were getting them when they were doing POVs, I was getting them and I was, I was like, well, I have to understand how auto DevOps really works in order to understand how to debug these things. So as I wrote my user story for this particular session, um, I want to you know, learn the mechanics of how auto build and auto deploy work um, so that I can troubleshoot deployment issues when they come up in my demo projects with customers and prospects and also guide our customers on what the appropriate use is of auto DevOps and what it is not, especially around the auto build. It's not just magic. You don't just throw in any random code and you get something deployed into Kubernetes. It's, it's not as simple as that. Um, so you know, what are those kind of guide rails that we can provide for customers? And then what are the next topics that we really need to dig into or I really need to dig into anyway to really understand how all this works and comes together? As I start to dig in, I think about this as peeling back the layers, a lot like peeling back the layers of an onion because there are a lot of them and sometimes they make you cry. So, <laughs> so you know, that's how it goes um, as we learn all the technical details of how this works. I have to say, I'm just so impressed by your engineering team. Every time I look at Auto DevOps and see all of the amazing logic that's built into this prescriptive pipeline, it's really cool, but there's just a lot to understand to really get how it all works. And so I feel like I always have to have a disclaimer when I start diving into topics like this. Um, in order to really understand it all, you need to be an expert in a lot of different areas, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, Heroku, Helm, um, other related areas. I'm not an expert in any of those. so. I have a goal of presenting this stuff in a way that is me learning as a non-expert. Um, and my goal for this particular session is to give you kind of the 200 level. If you think about college courses, you know, the 100 level marketing stuff is great. Let's get to the next level. Let's not get to the graduate level yet because if we start to talk about the really technical details without understanding some of the higher level details first is gonna be challenging. So I'm coming at this from a new perspective and I am shooting for 80 to 85% accuracy and completion in the content that I provide. Um, and I would love to drive additional conversation. I figure if everyone on this call learns one thing today and I learn one thing, then it is a huge success and um, valuable use of our hour or 50 minutes of time. So um, as I started to put this presentation together and started to put things into slides, I then realized that there's so much content, there's so much stuff to learn. And so, you know, last night at about 7.30 at night, I was like, I have to have 30 minutes worth of talking points and I have like 60 slides and I started like hiding a whole bunch of slides and I said, okay, I've got to cut this back a little bit. There's always a chance to do some follow-up later on. So we're going to pivot just a little. And so for today, I just want to talk about 
my process for investigating auto DevOps and what I've learned about auto DevOps in general along the way, because I think that will help everybody. And then how does auto build really work? I think my biggest learning, which is so obvious, um, it, once you know it, there's so much about auto DevOps. Once you know it, it's so obvious. Um, but my biggest learning so far is that auto deploy is going to fail in a lot of cases because what you built doesn't actually run appropriately. So let's dig into auto build first and let's um, get beyond thinking that that's magic and talk about how we build apps in the container appropriately so that we can run them with an auto deploy process. And um, let's talk about some debugging for when your auto deploy fails. And then there's a whole bunch of good stuff that I've learned this past week around auto deploy and how that works and going from Helm 2 to Helm 3 and you know, no longer needing tiller and doing things like worker processes for things like email uh, notifications and stuff that your apps need. We're not gonna get to any of that today. We'll, we'll cover all of that auto deploy stuff at another time. So let's dig in. Now that's all the fun of my presentation. There's not another picture in here. <laughs> so now we have to actually do the real work and talk about the, the technical meaty stuff. Um, so first of all, what do we require for auto DevOps? There is a documentation page that has some of this. Um, uh, this like, I'm gonna just be overly transparent in learning about this stuff, I kind of felt reading through a documentation, how I feel reading through a handbook at times. There's so much stuff, but it's not all organized in a way that's necessarily the easiest to follow. Um, but I'd rather have more documentation than less. So it's not a complete, it's just an expression of being a little bit overwhelmed at the beginning, trying to figure out uh, what we really need for auto DevOps. So, we don't really need a Kubernetes integration. Auto DevOps is smart enough that it will skip the review app and deploy jobs if you don't have a Kubernetes integration at your project or group level. But if you do set up the Kubernetes integration, it will do those deploy jobs um, as part of the Auto DevOps pipeline. Um, if you set up a, an ingress, cube ingress based domain, um, as part of the integration, you do not have to set the variable to set it, but you do have to set a base domain that is used in the auto deploy job, um, either through that integration or through a variable. And you need an Nginx ingress controller set up. Um, and Karen and I were talking about at the beginning of this call how um, we are removing the uh, ability to install those GitLab managed apps through the UI and you have to do it through a CI job starting, I think, 14, so just heads up on that aspect of things. Um, from a Docker perspective, every single auto DevOps job runs a Docker container that has everything in it that it needs to process that job, except for the source code that it copies in um, after it does the Git checkout. But any analyzers, any scripts that are needed, it's all built into that image that gets um, that a container gets spun up, up from and runs everything in there. So you need a Docker executor for a GitLab runner. Um, you can use Docker machine executors or Kubernetes executors as well, um, but you need to have Docker executors to run auto DevOps jobs. Um, the auto build job, I think a couple of the other auto DevOps jobs as well, but definitely the auto build job for sure still needs Docker and Docker. And that means a couple of things. First of all, you need to have privilege mode enabled in your runners, which we know from some customers is somewhat sensitive. Um, and you have to specify, if you're gonna write your own build job, you have to specify the Docker and Docker service. Um, if you are using auto, um, auto DevOps, auto builds, you don't have to specify it's part of the job. And we use um, 1903.12 Docker and Docker service. Uh, specified in the GitLab CI YAML file. Uh, another thing that I learned just this past week, um, OpenShift all of a sudden is becoming a hot topic and then the new OpenShift GitLab runner operator to be able to very easily spin up runners within OpenShift and use them. Uh, they do not support Docker in Docker, so you cannot use them for auto DevOps jobs. So just be aware of that if you're guiding your customers. 
Um, another thing I just discovered this week, which again, things are obvious once you know them, but not obvious until you discover them sometimes. Um, that seems to be my theme at GitLab, <laughs> like generally speaking. But um, we're assuming that any application you build runs on port 5000. And if your application is not running on, going to run on port 5000, you need to specify that port in an auto deploy values YAML file in a .gitlab directory. So um, everything about auto build and auto deploy will assume that your app is going to be available to run at 5,000 by default. And then uh, somewhat of a simpler, more obvious thing, your repo does need to contain either a Docker file, so we can do a Docker build and Docker push um, to build the application, or it needs to contain source code that can be built with the appropriate build packs. We're gonna talk more about Heroku-ish and Heroku build packs and cloud native build packs in just a few minutes. All right, so a lot of us know this, that when you, you know, start to talk about auto DevOps with your prospects, you open up a code repository and you add a .gitlab CI YAML file, and there's templates available for you built right into uh, GitLab. So you can just choose the auto DevOps template and it shows you um, this auto DevOps format that has each um, different job template included in it. And it also has some workflow rules built into the uh, GitLab CI file. Now I started to dig into this because it's like, pretty obvious what it's doing. It's checking to make sure that your uh, repository contains a type of app that can actually be built by a Heroku build pack or a Docker file, right? So at the high level, that makes sense. But then when I started to look at the very first rule with these, this if condition, I was like, what is that? But auto DevOps explicitly enabled equals equals one. So, so I thought I'd share this because I'm not sure that everyone else knows this either. There are two ways to enable auto DevOps, right? You can either use this GitLab CI YAML file, put it in your repository, and then it has all the logic built in and calls all the different uh, job templates that are provided as part of auto DevOps. Or there's that little um, setting at the project level um, under CI or at the group level it's available under CI and what I learned a couple of weeks ago is that at the instance level for self-managed instances, you can also enable auto DevOps for the entire instance, just by checking a box, flipping a switch. Then the auto DevOps is on for everyone um, in that group um, or across the instance, if you set it at the instance level. When you do that, what I discovered is that this auto DevOps explicitly enabled um, environment variable gets set to one. And what that means is that now every time um, someone does something that would start a pipeline, we're going to run an auto DevOps pipeline, right? So it's every time somebody in a project where this is set um, tags, does a, a git tag or does a git push or a commit, um, we're going to run auto DevOps. This rule, which is interesting and I still don't understand why we did it this way. This will say, um, we don't care what's in your repository. We are going to start a pipeline every time you do something that should start CI, right? So what is the impact of this? Um, and I, I was kind of surprised, I'm still kind of surprised and I haven't had a chance to follow up with the, the product team. But if I enable auto DevOps, let's say this is enabled at the group level instead of the project level or the instance level, um, the, the impact is basically that anytime somebody creates a new repository, just with a readme file in it or any kind of CRUD in it, like you really don't want CI file, it's gonna start running pipelines. It's gonna run auto DevOps pipelines and it's going to fail those pipelines because you don't have anything that's buildable in your project but it's not even just one or two jobs that start because remember with auto DevOps, we're so clever. We start the build job, we start the test job, a code quality job, hey, code quality passes when you only have a readme in your repo, hey. Um, and we also start this cleanup job all when the pipeline starts. So effectively, I would recommend 
for most customers that they do not turn on auto DevOps for an entire group or for an entire um, instance, because if you have people who are just creating new repos that don't have anything in them yet, or um, are creating repos that they don't want to use CI for, you're going to start uh, using a lot of resources and runners, using up your pipeline minutes if you're on gitlab.com, um, your CI minutes, and things that really shouldn't be running CI. So just keep that in mind. I thought it was interesting. Um, and what's even more interesting about it is that even if I then put in a GitLab, the GitLab CI YAML file, which is the auto DevOps template that has these workflow rules built in, it's still gonna run pipeline every time I change the readme file as an example, because this auto DevOps explicitly enabled value is set to one because that, that switch is flipped. Um, so I'm just running a lot of jobs that don't really need to be run in this particular project. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody and is something useful to think about. Um, so, and the other thing that's interesting is that if you are, um, when you are just using the auto DevOps template out of the box, um, so the auto DevOps functionality without explicitly setting the template, uh, even if you do have source code in your repository, but it doesn't fit this specific pattern. As I said before, it's gonna run auto DevOps jobs. So you only know that it doesn't fit the specific pattern once the build job fails, your build packs will tell you it's something that's not buildable. So just keep that in mind. I do like using this file explicitly because it will check that you have the right thing in your repository and Heroku build packs basically work the same way. It's going to say, do you have a Panda XML file or do you have a Gradle file or do you have one of these other file types that we can actually build that source code um, and deploy it. Okay, so then the next thing we tend to do is say, hey, look, each of these templates has, or each of these jobs has a template associated to it. And so Auto DevOps is this prescriptive set of stages and jobs within each stage to allow you to fully test and do security scans on your code. And we can take a look at what each of these jobs actually does. And of course you have the ability to override these jobs and customize them to suit your needs if you want to, which is great. We provide the source code um, link. So we can take a look at the, uh, the YAML file for every job and see what it's actually doing. And then <laughs> we have to be a little bit careful when we do that because the, uh, the links point to the latest version of the CI job for that template in the master branch. That is not necessarily the version of the job that's being run in your pipeline. And I only really put all the pieces together with this recently because I was trying to figure out why my auto deploy job was still using Tiller when we now support Helm 3 with the latest version of the auto deploy that doesn't use Tiller. So a couple of things that we have to keep in mind here. There are versions of each template that get released with a specific version of GitLab. So for self-managed instances, the 13.10 version of GitLab may have a different version of each of these job templates than the 13.9 version of GitLab. If you're using that um, CI template file explicitly though, so you say, okay, add a new GitLab CI YAML file, use the auto DevOps template. Here we have the entire text file with all the explicit includes of the individual jobs. That's going to get pinned to whatever version of GitLab you are using at the time when you um, add that file to your repo. What does that mean? As you start to, uh, your admin starts to upgrade your repo to the latest version. So if you're using 13.9, you get the 13.9 version of .gitlab CI YAML. Once we upgrade to 13.10, you're still on the 13.9 version of the overall CI file, but you're using the 13.10 version of all of the included job files now. So each job template is now using the latest. And that's why, you know, when I first started working at GitLab, I don't, I don't know, I think over the summer or the fall, we made a bunch of changes to how our SAS jobs worked. We you know, separated out secrets detection from the main SAS job. And as you start to see all that stuff in real time because we are using the latest version of each of those templates 
when we're including the file and saying, hey, go look at that template and pull that template in. Um, that was something that kind of blew my mind when I finally pieced this all together like yesterday. I think <laughs> I've only been here for 11 months, learn something new every day. Um, and then the other thing is, especially when you're working with um, customers and helping them in their own POVs, make sure you know what version of GitLab they're on because these each individual template file may change slightly from release to release of GitLab. You want to be looking at the appropriate version when you're looking at the source. So don't go to the latest or master, go choose the appropriate tag. We do use um, semantic versioning and we tag all of these template repos with every release of GitLab so you can go and find the specific version of each of these files that's used. Now in each of these GitLab files, the next thing we have to keep, in tr keep track of is that each of these uses a particular image, uh, Docker image, again, that has everything built into it that we need for that particular job to run, whether it's a scanner, a custom build script um, that GitLab has created, whatever the case may be. Make sure you're looking at the right version of the image as well. I kept you know, trying to trace through everything and I was like, well, it says over here in this job that we should be doing this thing and I don't see that thing in the output. Well, it's because some of these template jobs are pinned to older versions of GitLab images, not the current version that GitLab has produced. Okay, so how do we see how we even created this image to begin with? Um, ignore the registry in the front, go to gitlab.com and then follow the entire path. And you're going to get the project that actually is responsible for building and pushing this image that ends up getting used um, for that particular job. Right, so here we're in our gitlab.com, gitlab org cluster integration auto deploy image. I now go and choose version 107 because that's the version of the image that my current template uh, for auto deploy is using. And now I can see how we're actually building that image and what gets put into that image. You'll notice in that project that there's a Docker file that specifies how that image gets built. And a lot of times for these different um, auto DevOps jobs, you'll see these copy commands and that's saying, we're gonna copy some stuff that's in our project repository into this Docker image so we can use that for our particular job. So in this particular case of auto deploy, we're copying a source directory and we're copying an assets directory. So if we go back and look at what the project repository looks like, um, we see the source bin directory that gets copied in and we see assets auto deploy up that gets copied into the image. And these things get used as part of the processing of the auto deploy job. So if you really want to see what the job is doing, you have to look at what's in those directories um, to, to understand what the particular job is doing. And then if we go back and we look at our original um, template file or CI YAML file, in this case for auto deploy, it starts to now all come together and make sense, right? The script block for this particular job says, do these you know, eight things or whatever the case may be. In this case, auto deploy, check cube domain, auto deploy, blah, blah, blah. For the longest time, I was like, what does auto deploy mean? Well, that's the script that's in the source um, bin directory. There's an auto deploy script that has all these different functions built into it. So check cube domain, great. Now I can go and see, I can walk through line by line by line and see exactly what these things are doing. Um, if you're not really familiar with shell scripting, we have um, a bunch of these, uh, we like to use these flags a lot, these conditional flags, that dash Z, dash D. Um, it's checking to see, um, and I have them on the notes somewhere and I can't remember them all, all the time. Is, a, is it a null value? I think is dash Z. Um, dash N means a non-null value, so a string with any length. Um, we check to see if a file exists or not, if that file is a directory. So. Um, there is a whole reference. I have a, a link at the end, I think, that tells you all the reference uh, flags that get used in these shell scripts. But the good news is shell scripts are pretty easy to read as long as you know what those flags mean. So you can just walk through each of these scripts. And most of these jobs have a script that gets built into the Docker image that does most of the steps of the actual CI 
script block itself. Okay, so that's just some you know process of how do we even figure out what each of these jobs does. Hopefully that was helpful to at least some of you. Um, now I wanna dig in a little bit more into the auto build job and talk about what that does. So as all of you probably already know, we use Heroku build packs with Herokuish um, uh, to automatically build your application code and deploy it to the cloud. Heroku is a platform as a service. Um, they said, hey, there's a lot of developers out there who are developing cool, simple web apps, um, but we want to abstract the ability, um, abstract all the details of how we actually deploy these things to the cloud. We can offer a service that will handle all of that in an automated fashion so they can just push to remote, uh, a Git remote, and we can build everything, package it up, deploy it in the cloud for them without them having to worry about how to do this stuff on their own. And it's gonna simplify um, application development and, and allow more teams to get um, good you know, web apps out there fast. So that's great. Herokuish is just a, an emulator that says, yeah, we're gonna use those Heroku build packs to basically build your application in a Docker container and um, you know, deploy it. So everything's containerized. Um, as we started, as the industry started moving to cloud native apps, uh, a lot of people weren't really familiar with them and weren't really sure how to dockerize or containerize their applications. So again, for simple apps, this is a way to not make those developers, those teams have to worry about all those details, but get containerized apps deployed very quickly. Now, at some point, um, you know, Pivotal Cloud Foundry came around and said, well, Heroku is doing this, we can do this too. We can create our own version of these Heroku build packs that, you know, look for different types of applications and automatically build and deploy them. And then other platform as a service providers like Google Cloud and others came along too and started to say, hey, we can all use these things. It's a great idea. Um, and at some point, uh, the standard Heroku build packs and the pivotal version of the Heroku build packs kind of got out of sync and there are two different sets of build packs floating around. And the good news is that Pivotal and Heroku decided that that was not the smartest thing to do, that they should be in partnership and they should offer build packs that could be consumed in an open source fashion by the industry as a whole and work together. So cloud native build packs is the result of that partnership between Pivotal and Heroku kind of bring a common standard to build pack usage. So I think about six months ago, maybe or so, um, GitLab started supporting cloud native build packs. There is an environment variable that you can set to say use a cloud native build pack, um, auto DevOps build image CMP enabled, use cloud native build packs instead of Heroku build packs. Um, and, and digging into it, looking at it, my understanding, this is a simple, simplified version of, of what cloud native build packs are compared to Heroku, but um, essentially um, for our purposes and the build packs we use by default with cloud native build packs, it's just a wrapper around the Heroku build packs to use the new format, the new um, syntax that cloud native build packs provide. So it's all the same concepts. So you don't really have to worry about are you using the cloud native or not. I'm sure that there are some reasons that people will want to start using the cloud native format um, instead of Heroku. Um, but don't worry too much about that, I would say, for now. And Heroku build packs are still the default for GitLab. So with build packs, it's interesting because, you know, I know <laughs> I just think back to the the uh, demo I did during my interview process and I cringe now because I didn't understand what any of these things meant as I was explaining them but, um, um, during my interview. So, um, you know, I've come a long way probably, hopefully. Um, but in any case, it's not magic. You know, that's the most important thing that our prospects have to understand that we have to understand when we're helping them. There's no magic here. Um, you can't just take any application code, even if it's code that you can build locally on your um, own laptop, that's not necessarily sufficient to be able to deploy it um, in a container via Heroku build packs, okay? 
So the good news though, is that for each type of build pack, so for each type of application you want to build, there is documentation about what Heroku expects for that particular build pack. So we can go and look at, if we wanna build a Java Maven app, what does the Heroku build pack say for Java, right? We need a pom.xml file in a root directory. Okay, if we don't have that, we're not gonna be able to build. Um, some other POM formats are supported. Um, but also, you know, if we're going to build this app, by default, um, when we use Heroku build packs, we're gonna use Maven 362 and Open, Open JDK 8. And if you want to use different versions of those things, you need to specify them. Um, so there are particular ways that we need to set the different configurations that we need in order to build and deploy our app successfully. The good news here is that if we go to um, Glider Labs Heroku-ish on GitHub, we can see what specific build uh, packs, which Heroku build packs are being used. So important thing to make sure everybody understands here is that Heroku-ish doesn't have its own build packs. It just uses the standard Heroku build packs. But if you wanna see which versions it uses, we can go to Heroku-ish, go to the build packs directory, and then we can say, okay, for Java as an example, let's go and take a look at that. And there's a build pack URL, it's just a single line, which points back to the build pack from Heroku that's actually being used. Okay, and in Heroku, when we go to that URL, we have all the documentation about what's expected, how we build apps and deploy them using this build pack, with, in this case for Java Maven. Um, and so if there's any question about whether our, why our app isn't building successfully, why we can't deploy it, we can go and look at that. Okay, so that's important to know because sometimes the information here will help you determine why um, your app is blowing up once you start to try to run it in a Docker container. And then I'm gonna be honest, and most of you probably know this already, um, but I need to be honest here. Um, Max Power tipped me off to this yesterday. And for some reason, if I hover over, it pops up that stupid Google slide thing, but proc file. <laughs> this is a, a, a file that Heroku expects that's in the root of your repository that tells, basically um, specifies how the application gets executed. So how do you run your app? Um, now you don't always need a proc file and in every single um, app I've used so far for auto DevOps, I have not specified one and been just fine. Um, and for simple web apps, it will figure out for you what that proc file, you know, how are you going to run a jar file, you know, Java dash jar, whatever that, the name of the jar file is. Um, but you really should specify one, especially if you're, you're getting into some more specifics in terms of how that application needs to run. Okay, so I thought I'd point that out because it was something new for me. And there is a link in the slide deck um, to the proc file documentation in Heroku. All right, so what does auto build do? Um, it does a couple of things. So first of all, it sets two environment variables, CI application repository and CI application tag. I point this out because these variables point to the Docker image that we're going to, first of all, um, push to the container registry and then the same Docker image that's going to be pulled from the registry to be deployed in the auto deploy job. Um, so if we want to, uh, write our own build job, for example, uh, that, or maybe we already have a Dockerized app um, that we can build outside of auto build, we can set the CI application repository and CI application tag values to whatever that repository name is for that Docker image and the tag value. So we pull the right image to deploy it. You know, there's a lot, lot of logic built into the build script to get to the CI application repository and tag names correct based on uh, predefined environment variables that are part of our CI job. 
Um, after we do that, we run our build script and that goes and looks for, you know, the appropriate build pack, builds our application, um, copies the, the application files into our um, uh, Docker image um, and then, you know, pushes the image to the repository. Um, so those are basically the steps I described here. Um, and the key part is that when we're pushing to that GitLab uh, container registry, we are pushing an image that is named with the CI application repository value and has the tag CI application tag. Um, what do these things actually mean? Well, basically for a branch pipeline, the CI application repository is going to be the name of um, the branch. Um, and so it's not really the branch name, it's the first 65 characters, all lowercase with alphanumeric characters, non alphanumeric characters removed and replaced with a dash. It's called CI commit ref slug if you care about the environment variable and that gets printed out. But if you go look at your container registry to make sure your Docker image was built and pushed correctly, you want to look to see that you have a repository that is the name of the branch you're working from and that it has a, a an image tag that is the commit hash of the commit um, that is being built in your CI pipeline. Okay, a lot of times when auto deploy fails because it, we don't actually have that Docker image with the correct name and tag in our container registry. And the errors you get don't tell you, hey, you don't have that correct Docker image. It, it just gives you some abstract error that you have to go figure out on your own. Um, so you do wanna check those things. If you're running a pipeline um, that's the result of a git tag operation, things are a little bit different. The Docker repo name will have the name of the commit SHA and the tag that gets applied from, from a Docker tag perspective is the name of the git tag that you specified when you did that tag operation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are valid reasons for not wanting to do auto builds but building your own um, app instead using your own build job. Um, I went through this process because I wanted to make sure I understood what happened with the auto build. You could run auto build and still use a Docker file. So basically the Docker file is gonna give all the instructions for how to build your app and then put it into a Docker container. Um, I wanted to write my own job to do it just so that I understood that I was following the right process and getting the right things to the container registry and not missing any holes and, or details of, of how this actually works. Um, if you do, decide to use a Docker file and your own build steps instead of using Herokuish, it does speed up the process a bit. Um, and not using auto build speeds up the build process a little bit more because it doesn't go through all that logic in terms of figuring out, is there a Docker file or is this an app that has to build, be built with Heroku and all of that. So from a performance perspective, um, doing it yourself does give you some benefits. Um, using a Docker file instead of using Heroku build packs also gives you more control over how you're building that application and allows you to streamline your overall Docker image. So if your image sizes start to get you know, um, a, to be a concern, you know, maybe not using the build packs, but using uh, your own build process with a Docker file is a better route. Um, so it's really simple if we go through a, just a simple Spring Boot app time already. So I'm going to finish this up and then we'll get on to uh, answering questions. I'm looking in the doc. I don't see any questions yet, but please do feel free to add them if you have them. Um, but if you want to build your own app, it's as simple really as um, doing a build job, saving your artifacts as a jar, you know, jar file, or whatever your, your compiled binaries are, uh, saving them as artifacts, and then copying those artifacts into the container and specifying in the, in the Docker file. How would you build your Docker image? Copy um, your jar file. I just copied my jar file into something called app.jar. And then of course we specify an entry point for the Docker image that says, how are we going to run this Docker container once we spin it up and start to run it? How are we going to run the application inside of it? 
simple java-jar, app.jar will do the trick in this case. It can be more complicated than that, right, for other types of apps. Um, here in for our app, we're exposing port 8080 to use 8080 for this app to run. That means for the auto deploy, we also have to specify um, port values in a, a YAML file in order for this to deploy successfully. And then we're basically logging into our Docker uh, registry, container registry before, or in, as part of the before script, we're building our uh, Docker image, and then we're pushing it to the container registry. Um, in this case, I just want to point out, I did not tag with latest here. I should also have a, a build, uh, a dash T latest, so that whenever we're replacing our previous image with a newer one, that newer one gets referenced with the latest tag as well, but I was lazy, so I didn't do that in this particular case. Now, why do I point all of this out? Because the auto deploy job is going to take that built image um, and it's going to grab it from the registry and then it's going to use Helm to deploy it into a pod. Okay, and all those steps we're gonna skip until later. And uh, the last thing I just wanna talk about is how do you know what happened if things go wrong? So how do you start debugging things? Um, set trace to equal one as an environment variable, either at the project level or within your CI file, that's gonna give you additional output. Um, so you can go through the auto deploy file, you can see when it's actually doing, you know, creating the namespace using kubectl and create namespace, when it's doing the Helm um, upgrade command, you're gonna see more information there that's gonna help you. Um, there's also another variable, auto DevOps deploy debug that you can set to true, which will provide additional Helm debug logs that get added to or uploaded as part of the artifacts for the deploy job. If everything looks good there and you can't figure that out, um, another helpful trip, tip is to disable Postgres if you're not using a database for your application. It's just another container that gets spun up and deployed that you don't need. And there's some complexities there that you can get rid of just by setting Postgres enabled to be false. Um, if you are doing the build yourself, make sure that you can actually see artifacts saved as part of your build job. Um, and make sure that your app actually is something that is built successfully out, outside of Docker. Like forget about Docker for a minute. Can you actually take the code and build the app yourself? If not, there's probably a problem. Um, in a lot of cases, the build job will fail, but sometimes the build job will succeed, but then it's not something that can actually run in a, in a containerized environment. Um, if you're using the auto build job, make sure you go through the Heroku specific deploy troubleshooting documents because there are cases where um, for Node.js as an example, you may have a different version of the package manager um, than you need or something like that. Um, and it gives you a lot of guidance there to make sure that you can check your app and, and make sure it's actually building successfully. And then look and see that there is a container in the registry with the appropriate name and tag so that there actually is a, uh, an image to pull for the auto deploy. I, I have to tell you, I made this mistake at least 10 times and didn't realize it for hours that I wasn't actually pushing, I was building an app but not pushing it to the registry and it was trying to deploy it, giving me some like random error, timed out waiting for a condition. What does that mean? Well, it means I can't find a stupid <laughs> image to deploy, but it didn't tell me that. Um, and then can you run the Docker container successfully? Like run it, like do a Docker run command from the command line on your machine and point to the registry, point to the image in the uh, container registry that you think is being deployed and make sure it runs successfully. I did that a couple of times and I saw like huge blowups and errors happening. It means that my app wasn't built correctly within the container. So it can actually run that. So the auto deploy job is not going to tell you why that crapped out. It's just going to tell you that it didn't work. Um, finally, check, make sure your cluster is healthy and um, make sure that your namespace exists. GitLab will create the namespace for you if you have a GitLab managed cluster. If you don't, you have to create the namespace yourself. By default, it's a namespace per environment that you're deploying to. 
um, do some cleanup. And if you are cleaning up your cluster, uh, deleting a bunch of namespaces for old review apps as an example, make sure you're clearing the Kubernetes cluster cache. And you can do that right from the integration, the cluster integration settings on the advanced tab. And that typically does the trick. If you delete the namespace, clear the cache, let the deploy job run again, it will create the namespace for you and deploy the app successfully. Well, I went seven minutes over, so I didn't do such a good job with obeying the time box, but I tried. <laughs> um, there's a lot more to this. So I do wanna make sure that we have some time for some discussion though. So let's open it up. What, what questions does everyone have? I don't see any in the doc. Yet. I wanted to say fantastic job. What a quick study on uh, Auto DevOps. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. I had a great presentation I had, too. I, I love your presence. It's it's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. I had a quick question. Um, what yeah. happens if we're grabbing the auto DevOps packages from our .com site, which seems to be the default, and customers are disconnected because they are at a secure facility of some kind of you know their favorite three letter agency or a bank or what yeah. have you. What do we do in that case? There, okay, so my understanding is that the templates themselves are packaged with the GitLab instance, but the, the images that get pulled get pulled from gitlab.com. So the template will run and it will say, go grab this image from the container registry on gitlab.com. And it won't be able to do that because it's a disconnected environment. Um, there are some instructions for how to um, pull everything local into local registry to use those instead. I don't know all the details of those off the top of my head, but there have been several uh, threads in Slack about this for disconnected um, environments. So we'll okay. make sure we get those specific. Your understanding is the same as mine, but I've never tried it. So that's why I figured it out. Yeah. No, I, I recall a couple of threads on it, but I don't know the details of how to make that work. Does anyone else on the call right now know off the top of their head how to make that work or know where that documentation is? I know the documentation is called air gapped. Air gapped. Uh, that's, that's what... Yeah, if you search that that phrase, you might find some stuff. Okay. Great. I just posted a link to our docs in the Zoom chat. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, let me pull it up here too. I can't find the chat now, so <laughs> good enough. <laughs> yeah, and I'm seeing there is um, specific yeah. scanner instructions for running these offline for SAS, DAS, license, all that kind of fun stuff. Awesome. Yeah, I just yeah, added that link to our notes doc too. Great. Fantastic. Great question too. What else? One minute lightning round. <laughs> yeah, some things I'll leave you with, and we will make sure that you have a copy of this presentation, but we are starting to use knowledge-based articles. So a lot of this information is now captured in a couple of different KD articles. Um, and I do have some links to some of those external resources I refer to as well. So you can take a look at them. All right, thank you so much, Julie. Fantastic session, fantastic presentation. We all really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everyone. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.